pues <coughs> buenas tardes a todos y bienvenidos a la reanudación de esta primera sesión del de simposio que, como saben, está dedicado al greco en Creta e Italia. Esta mañana pues hemos tenido la fortuna de asistir a dos magníficas conferencias sobre los años cretenses y esta tarde pues eh, escucharemos otras tres que estoy convencido que serán tan brillantes como ellas sobre la década que pasó el greco en Italia. Para ello contamos con eh, tres reconocidos especialistas venidos de ambos lados eh, del Atlántico que nos disertarán sobre aspectos verdaderamente fundamentales del quehacer del greco, como digo, en esos años en Venecia y en Roma. El primero de los eh, eh, conferenciantes de esta tarde, los participantes de esta tarde, tarde es Jongo Park, él es eh, conservador de la Freak Collection en Nueva York, ha escrito sobre arte tanto español como nuevo hispano, pero está aquí en su condición de especialista en el greco. Concretamente, está ultimando su tesis doctoral sobre la retratística del greco, dirigida por un eximio grequista, el profesor Jonathan Brown, en el Instituto of Fine Arts de la New York University. Y, sin más, les dejo con Diego Park, que les hablará sobre los retratos del greco entre Italia y España. Gracias. In the margins of his copy of Vasari's Lives, Agrippa wrote, Michelangelo did not know how to paint portraits. One cannot deny that he lacked and was impeded by the delicate qualities of portraiture. This bold statement, denouncing the divine Italian artist's abilities as a painter, is perhaps somewhat expected if we consider Agrippa's antagonism toward Florentine painting, and especially his sense of rivalry with Michelangelo. It is well known that he said, I quote, Michelangelo was a good man, but he did not know how to paint, in his conversation with Francisco Pacheco in 1611. What draws our attention here is the importance El Greco attached to portrait painting, which involves delicate rendering of hair and flesh through deft use of color. More importantly, the statement can also be read as an indication of his pride in his own skills in creating likenesses. In fact, portraiture was a genre for which the Cretan painter was most acclaimed during and even after his lifetime. Notable Spanish writers such as Alonso de Villegas, Francisco de Pisa, Hortensio Félix Paravicino, and Luis de Góngora praised the lifelikeness of El Greco's portraits and even Velázquez is reported to have been inspired by the Cretan artist's portraits he kept in his studio in the Alcázar. Virtuosity in portraiture is probably least expected of a painter coming from the tradition of Byzantine icons. Surprisingly, El Greco seems to have excelled in depicting likenesses by the time he arrived in Rome in 1570, after spending only three years in Venice. According to the recommendation letter that Giulio Clovio wrote to Cardinal Alessandro Farnese that year, El Greco painted a marvelous self-portrait that astonished the painters in Rome. The three surviving portraits that are universally accepted as El Greco's work from his Italian period characterize the painter's remarkable achievement of likeness, lifelikeness through painterly brushwork. Not only the faithful rendering of the sitter's appearance, but also the artistic invention he exercised in these portraits indicate that El Greco had a special interest in the art of portraiture from his early period. What could have been the reason for, the, for his enthusiasm for this conservative genre? 
El Greco's motivation to concentrate on portraiture appears to have been twofold. The first was his desire to secure patronage and elevate his social status, and the second was to experiment and express his ideas on painting. In today's talk, I will explore the significance of portraiture in El Greco's Roman years by approaching the issue from these aspects. In so doing, I wish to illuminate the importance of portraiture in El Greco's career and the crucial role of his experience as, a, as uh, his experience in Rome in his formation as an ambitious portraitist. Giulio Clovio's claim about El Greco's mastery of portraiture is confirmed by his own likeness painted by the Cretan artist, probably when he was still living in the Palazzo Farnese. In this work, El Greco de demonstrates his ability to depict psychologically penetrating likeness, likenesses paint based on exacting naturalism. The weathered face of the miniaturist in his 70s is unflattering. The painter does not attempt to hide the sitter's wrinkles, uneven complexion, or deeply set eyes. Rather, he seems to emphasize them, transcribing uh, Clovio's appearance as faithfully as possible. The triangular rendering of the sitter's upper torso against the, a neutral background and the motif of the window with a view of a landscape testify to El Greco's debt to Venetian masters such as Titian, Tintoretto, and Jacopo Bassano. More specifically, it has been suggested that El Greco took certain elements, such as the strong light on Clovio's face and his pose, holding his work in one hand and pointing at it with another, from Titian's portrait of Giulio Romano. It was natural for El Greco to employ the Venetian style for his portrait. Not only was it the manner in which he was trained, but, all, but it also would have seemed to ensure success at the Farnese court in Rome, where he saw the Cardinal's portrait collection and witnessed the preference given to works painted by Titian. The special attention given to portraits may be attributed to the practical function of the genre as visual propaganda. The collection generally consisted of contemporary likenesses of his family members, those of other ruling families, and those of various popes. Unlike Paolo Giovio's systematic collection of Womini Illustri images, Alessandro's was a result of the desire to perpetuate the memory of his family, as well as a reflection of the contemporary practice of exchanging portraits between princely courts for diplomatic means. He also had his own portrait painted at least four times by Innocenzo da Imola, Titian, Girolamo Muziano, and Scipione Puzzone. Among the portrait painters, Titian was by far the most esteemed by all the members of the Farnese family. In commissioning his work, they sought to emulate the practice in the household of Emperor Charles V. The first, the first of the Venetian master's portrait commissions was for the portrait of Ranuccio Farnese in 1542, followed by a portrait of Paul III in 1543. In order to have Titian paint more portraits for the Farnese family, Cardinal Alessandro even arranged to bring him to Rome. El Greco's interest in portraiture must have been reinforced by his first-hand observation of Titian's portraits of eminent men in the Farnese collection and the importance attached to the genre. Although El Greco was not granted opportunity to ex execute independent portraits for the Farnese, he attempted to win favor from the family by inserting a likeness of one of its members in his religious composition. In the Christ Healing the Blind, painted circa 1572, the figure of, the, of a young man standing in the far left appears to be a portrait. He looks out at the viewer and is dressed in contemporary att attire with a rough collar. The most likely candidate is Alessandro Farnese, the future Duke of Parma, who was the nephew of the cardinal of the same name. A comparison with the known likenesses of the young 
Alessandro, such as the ones by Girolamo Mazzola Bedoli and Antonis Mor, allows us to identify the figure in the El Greco painting as the future duke. Furthermore, the young nobleman's gorget, which is the neck protection, suggests his military career, which included his participation in the Battle of Lepanto. The history of the painting is not traceable before its appearance in the inventories of the Palazzo Farnese in 1644 and 1653, but that the figure seems to have been an afterthought by the painter might be an indication that the work was intended as a gift from El Greco to a member of the Farnese household. From his early period in Rome, however, El Greco does not limit himself to applying the tried and true formulae. A closer examination of the portrait of Giulio Clovio demonstrates that the painter exercised his artistic invention to make a visual statement of his own. Here, the painter uses a rectangular canvas with its width greater than its height instead of a vertically long canvas generally used in portraiture. This unusual feature is salient if we compare it with the more conventional portrait of Clovio painted by Sofonisba Anguissola in 1556. In both paintings, the sitter in a black coat with a simple white collar is depicted in a three-quarter view. El Greco, however, achieves a very different effect by adopting a horizontal format. The composition of the portrait allows the manuscript as well as the sitter to be emphasized. Clovio looks out at the viewer and points his right hand to a book, actively directing the viewer's attention to it. The images on the folios, the creation on the left and the Holy Family on the right, indicate that the volume is the Farnese Book of Hours illustrated by Clovio for Cardinal Farnese in 15. 46, El Greco asserts that the Farnese Hours is not a mere attribute, but the sitter's proud creation that merits the viewer's gaze. Clovio's finger nearly touches the manuscript, which recalls the finger of God about to give life to his most valued creation in Michelangelo's creation of Adam. It is also telling that the open page from the Farnese Hours shows the creation of the sun and the moon. The view of a landscape through the window placed directly above the manuscript reminds God's creation of nature and urges the viewer to compare it to the artist's work. Reference to Clovio's art is found also in the overall composition of this portrait. Clovio's illustrations for Grimani Evangelistery show evangelists holding their work in a room with an, op with an opening in one corner, which is a formula El Greco borrowed for his portrait. Some obvious adjustments, such as the sitter's gaze and the position of the opening, have been made to better serve the purpose of the portrait. In a sense, the portrait of, a, of Giulio Clovio is El Greco's statement of his belief in the nobility of painting as well as an expression of homage to his friend's famous works. The artistic authority that the Cretan grants to the miniaturist is more evident in his religious work, Christ driving the money changers from the temple. On the lower right corner of the painting, the painter added a strip of canvas that features four masters of Italian Renaissance art, Titian, Michelangelo, Giulio Clovio, and Raphael. As noted by many scholars, it is a visual footnote honoring the artists who, who inspired the Cretan, Cretan painter. It is remarkable that El Greco chose to substitute the art of each painter with individual portraits as if the essence of an artist is best represented through his likeness. El Greco was never officially hired by Cardinal Farnese but he attracted Fulvio Orsini, who served as the Cardinal's librarian as, and art advisor. In fact, the portrait of Giulio Clovio originally belonged to the collection of Orsini, probably given to him by Clovio. 
the inventory of the librarian's painting collection, dated January 31st, 1600, also includes El Greco's small-scale roundels of Cardinal Farnese, Ranuccio Farnese, Cardinal Bessarion, and Pope Marcellus II, along with a portrait of a young man in a red cap. Although these works do not survive today, they suggest that El Greco's main activity in the Farnese court was that of a portraitist. The Portrait of a Scholar is another work that reflects El Greco's continued interactions with the Roman intellectuals and the recognition of his art of portraiture by a select few. The identity of the sitter, though much debated, is unknown. It had been considered a self-portrait of Tintoretto before the discovery of El Greco's signature in 1898. Since the confir confirmation of authorship, the sitter has been identified with Giovanni Battista Porta, Andrea Palladio, or a member of Orsini's circle of letterati. What is certain about this portrait is that it seems to have been inspired by Titian's portrait of Pietro Bembo. The representation of the three-quarter length figure against a neutral background, as well as the gesture of the sitter's right hand, follow, follows Titian's model. In addition to El Greco's exposure to paintings by the master in Venice, the environment at the Palazzo Farnese would have had a more direct connection to the execution of the painting. Fulvio Orsini's collection included a copy of Titian's portrait of Pietro Bembo, and it is likely that the, paint, the Cretan painter had the, the opportunity to study it closely. El Greco worked for the circle of the Cardinal for about a year and a half before being dismissed for unknown reasons. After he fell out of Cardinal Farnese's favor in 1572, he had to find other ways to earn a living in the Eternal City. While searching for opportunities to secure patronage, he enrolled in the Compañía di San Luca to work as an independent artist. Given the circumstances, which was pretty desperate, it is likely that El Greco's Vincenzo Anastagi, proudly signed by the artist in Greek capitals, represents an effort to draw the attention from powerful men. The identity of the sitter in the work is known by an old inscription an old inscription on a pedestal that is no longer, no longer visible in the painting. During the treatment of the work in 1958 to 59, it was covered up as it was believed to be an addition by another hand in the 16th century. Nevertheless, the near contemporary dating of the inscription suggests that the identity of the sitter is secure. The text reads as follows. Brother Vincenzo Anastagi, after having been governor of the Citta Vecchia of Malta and having commanded during the siege of that island, one of the two companies of cavalry and also a company of infantry was many times in command of other infantry companies and was sergeant major of the Marca. He was several times honored by the Grand Master with three command commanderies. He died in Malta as captain of the flagship of the galleys in the year 1586 and the 55th of his life. Born to a noble family in Perugia around 1531, Vincenzo Anastagi became a Knight of Malta on February 13, 1563. He was most famous for his contribution to the victory against Ottoman Turks during the siege of Malta in 1565. He was also known as an expert in fortifications and his life was included in Picorpasso's Il Libro delle Piante e Litrati delle Città and Leone Pascoli's Vite de Pittori, Scultori et Architetti Perugini. According to archival records in Perugia and Malta, Anastasio was away from the island of Malta from 1571 to 79. During this period, he seems to have spent some time in Rome to recruit new soldiers from Italy. As a middle-ranking nobleman, Anastagi would not have seemed a promising patron. Moreover, 
he does not appear to have been particularly interested in paintings and therefore would have been unlikely to commission further works. Anastasi was, however, connected to a very eminent personage, Jacopo Boncompagni, the natural son of Pope Gregory XIII. He moved to Rome in March 1572 when his father was elected Pope and in that year assumed the offices of governor of Rome's Castel Sant'Angelo and the head of the papal army. In May 1575, Jacopo Boncompagni named Anastasi as the Sergente Maggiore of the Castel Sant'Angelo. It was probably on this occasion that El Greco painted this portrait. The close connection between the two men may well have motivated El Greco to paint the portrait of Anastasi. It could be expected that El Greco's portrait would be shown to Bon Compagni and possibly even to the Pope. Furthermore, Bon Compagni had been known to be a great patron of the arts. He supported the poet, poet Torquato Tasso, the philosopher Francesco Patrizzi, and the composer Pierluigi Palestrina. Leading architects of the time also received Bon Compagni's encouragement. Andrea Palladio and Jacopo, Jacopo Vignola dedicated their literary works to him. In this context, El Greco's portrait of Anastasi would have been an ideal means of self-promotion. For his portrayal of Anastasi, El Greco would have looked to examples of military portraits, not only from Venice, but also from Rome and central Italy. The most recent successful likeness of this type available to El Greco most likely was Scipione Puzzone's portrait of Jacopo Boncompagni. The three-quarter length portrait of Boncompagni communicates the young sitter's high status by the detailed depic depiction of the opulent armor, the carefully groomed face, and the elegant hands. According to the inscription on the piece of paper in the sitter's right hand, the portrait was executed in 1574, only about one year before El Greco painted Vincenzo Anastasi. In his left hand, Bon Compagni holds a wooden letter case which suggests that the painting was probably commissioned when Jacopo was sent on a diplomatic mission to Ferrara to greet Henri de Valois, the future French king Henry III. The high esteem that Pulzone enjoyed as the most sought after painter oops, in Rome of the time would have also stimulated El Greco's ambitions. Moreover, El Greco would have known Pulzone personally through the Compagnia di San Luca, where the latter served as consul in 1573 and overseer of the accounts in 1575. A contemporary of El Greco's, Pulzone was born in Gaeta between 1540 and 1542. By the mid 1560s, he was in Rome where he had the opportunity to execute portraits and religious paintings commissioned by the Roman patrician families. Among the sitters whom he portrayed were dignitaries of the highest rank, such as Pope Pius V, Pope Gregory XIII, Cardinal Antoine Perenot de Granval, and Cardinal Alessandro Farnese. By the mid 1570s, Pozzone was acknowledged as the leading portrait, portrait painter in Rome. Pozzone's contemporary Raffaello Borghini testifies to the artist's portrait painting skills and popularity. I quote, Scipione Pozzone is so excellent in making portraits from life that they seem alive. Hence, it re was required of him to portray all the important gentlemen of Rome and all the beautiful ladies, unquote. That he was considered the foremost portrait painter is also evident in Cardinal Granville's statement. In a letter of 1583, the Spanish ambassador to Rome quotes the Cardinal, who was also portrayed by Pulzone in 1576, to recommend painters to decorate El Escorial. I quote, Granville praises the diseño of Geronimo Muziano, the color of Marcello Venusti, and the portrait of Scipione of Gaeta, unquote. Furthermore, the painter enjoyed personal relationships with powerful, powerful patrons. 
on July 15, 1574, Jacopo Boncompagni became the godfather of Pulzone's first son, Giacomo. Francesca Colonna Orsini, a member of two prominent noble families in Rome, was the god godmother of the painter's son. Pulzone's status would have provided a success model for, for El Greco, and his portrait of Boncompagni most likely offer, offer the Cretan a reference for his first portrait of a sitter in armor. Nonetheless, El Greco took a radically different approach in order to display his artistry. Representing Anastasia in armor would have given the artist an excellent opportunity. Contrary to previous studies that assume this work is a literal transcription of reality, El Greco's portrait shows that the painter went beyond the faithful description of the symbolic objects. The most significant example is the drastic abbreviation of the details in Anastasi's armor. A comparison with the infantry armor at the Metropolitan Museum of Art demonstrates that he, the harness in El Greco's painting conspicuously lacks the ornamental bands on the breastplate in accordance with the spiral decoration. On the left pauldron, the breastplate should have the diagonal bands that extend from top to bottom. The bands that fan out from the earpiece on the real burgonet are absent as well. Considering the symbolic significance attached to armor, it is highly unusual not to depict it in full detail. Anastasi's garniture features instead the blaze of light reflected on the metal surface. Depiction of armor had posed a constant challenge for Renaissance painters. In his own biography in The Lives, Vasari writes of his difficulty in representing the polish of the armor when painting the portrait of Alessandro de' Medici in 1534. Consulted by the young Vasari, Pontormo advises him not to view his painting alongside a real set of armor because his work will always look like a painting compared to the real object. Because it was considered arduous to transcribe the glittering armor on canvas, the artist's skill in faithfully imitating it drew praise. In his letter to Alfonso Davalos, Pietro Aretino expresses his admiration for Titian's masterful depiction of the metallic luster that is so close to nature that it dazzles and blinds the spectator. Tactile representation of the cool surface of the steel armor would have seemed a great opportunity for El Greco to display his abilities as a painter. By emphasizing the brilliant streaks of light bouncing off the breastplate, pauldrons, and remembrances, the painter enhances the effect of the armor, even at the cost of faithful transcription of the decorative motifs. El Greco's artistic experiments in the, in the portrait of Anastasi can also be found in the representation of the dark crimson curtain behind the figure's upper body. Its unusual over oval shape is at odds with the drapery typically drawn to one side in Italian Renaissance portraits. The painter appears to have taken careful measures to render the casual form of the curtain, which functions as an ingenious device for emphasizing the most important elements in the portrait, namely the sitter's face and armor. As can be seen in the Pentimento, El Greco moved the contour of the right edge of the drape upward in order to align, align it closer to the sitter's left forearm. Also, the X-radiograph shows that there was a wavy line between the figure's calves, which, is here, which might indicate that the curtain was originally intended to hang lower. By shortening its length, El Greco achieves a tighter focus on the upper body of the sitter. This unconventional background not only sets off the face, which is render, rendered in finer brush strokes, but also encourages the viewer to compare the texture 
of the fabric with the metal in its work. Creating the illusion of different materials was of, was of primary concern in Renaissance theory on the use of color. As Ludovico Dolce argued in, in his Dialogo della Pittura, I quote, the main problem of coloring resides in the imitation of flesh and involves diversifying the tones and achieving softness. Next, one needs to know how to imitate the color of draperies, silk, gold, and every kind of material so, that, so well that hardness or softness seems to be communicated to the greater or lesser degree which suits the quality of the material. One should know how to simulate the glint of armor." End quote. One of the prime examples of this can be found in Titian's portrait of Francesco Maria della Rovere, where the artist depicts the reflections of the crimson velvet on the helmet and the breastplate. Titian boasts his virtuosity in depicting different materials by representing the polished armor as both an object that has its own tactile quality and a surface that reflects the texture of the adjacent cloth. Taking into account the close affinity El Greco had with Venetian painters, the point of view shared by Aretino and Dolce would certainly have resonated with him. El Greco's departure from tradition in his portrait of Anastasi demonstrates his effort to differentiate his work from the established conventions of the military portrait. Exercising his artistic invention, the painter achieves a sense of lifelikeness quite distinct from that of Pulsone's meticulously executed portrait. El Greco's strategy was to emphasize Anastasi's military career and personal traits over his status. The sunburned face and threads of gray hair, rendered with short, powerful brush strokes, testified to his brilliant career on the battlefield rather than idealize his, fe his features to mask him with courtly elegance. The white hose accentuate the muscular calves that befit, that befit an experienced infantry officer. Anastasi's pose with his arms akimbo also conveys his character. This pose in Renaissance portraits typically reflects the, the self-confidence and composure of a male military figure. In the case of El Greco's Vincenzo Anastasi, the sense of self-possession is enhanced by the placement of the sitter's arms, which create a closed circular form around his torso. The X-radiograph shows that the painter altered the position of the sitter's left arm so that the elbow thrusts out, animating his body with muscular tension. In the 16th century, this gesture becomes associated with aggressive masculine virtues since the hand would be placed near a sword or a baton. Titian's Philip II exemplifies an early type of this gesture in a military portrait. The Spanish monarch grips the top of his scabbard as if to show his readiness to draw the rapier, reinforcing his martial prowess. It is this formula that El Greco had in mind when he first set his brush to execute, execute the work. The pentimento of the scabbard, indicates that the artist originally painted the rapier to point away from the sitter's body. The position of Anastasi's left hand also suggests that it had been intended to be placed on the hilt of the sword. As we see in the current version of the portrait, El Greco made an artful change by shifting the orientation of the sword without altering the position of the hand. The painter directs the viewer's attention to the gilded hilt and the, to the scabbard of the rapier that runs parallel to the vambrance, inviting the spectator to see the weapon almost as the extension of the captain's mighty forearm. El Greco's intention was not only to honor Vincenzo Anastasi and evoke his military, achie military achievements, but also to display his own invention through the depiction of the sitter in armor. El Greco's departure from Rome to Spain in 1576 
clearly shows that he did not succeed in gaining favor from in important personages through his innovative portraits. In other words, his attempts to use portraits as practical means to climb up the social ladder did not work. It is also true, however, that these failed projects did not hinder El Greco from continuing his career as a portraitist with intellectual prowess and aesthetic judgment. His likenesses executed in Spain demonstrate that he continued to exploit the practical functions of portraits as a means to gain larger commissions and that he carried on to experiment with his artistic ideas on portraiture not only in the, not only in the independent portraits but also in the images of the saints and apostles. El Greco's worldly aspiration to become a successful painter in Italy might have been frustrated, but his artistic inventions marked the beginning of his portraits that immortalized the artist as well as his sitters. Thank you. <laughs>